Evening, everybody. How you doing? So my name is Owen Richard. And I'm Thomas Lockney. And we're engineering leaders responsible for the Nike Quantified Self Platform. We've been at Nike for a little over three years. And I joined because Nike is known for their innovation. And being part of the technical innovation in Nike Digital was an awesome opportunity. I'm excited to share what we've iterated on over the past few years, which essentially is moving from an on-premises monolithic platform to a set of cloud-based microservices. So at Nike, we believe that if you have a body, you're an athlete. We're focused on serving every athlete personally. Because of this, we're passionate about innovation and performance. And that drove to the design of our platform. We're going to share with you today some of the lessons and principles that have guided us. So we wanted to make a commitment to you about what you should be getting out of this talk. We know it's the last session of the day, and we're the last session in between you and happy hour. So we're going to try to run through this as quickly but as clearly as possible so you can get there early. Really, though, you'll understand the reactive principles. We'll talk about the reactive principles and how we've applied them in our ecosystem and how you can use AWS to accelerate that. Uh, like I mentioned, we're a microservices-based shop. And over the years, we've learned some tips and tricks on how to make sure that your microservice ecosystem is running smoothly. And the title of our talk talks about billions and billions of metrics on a daily basis. That's data at scale. And so you should get some techniques about how to deal with data at scale from us, too. To really understand what our platform does, you should really understand the flagship products that talk to us. So I'm going to give you a quick run through about what those are. First of all, there's our Nike Plus Training Club, or NTC. It's your ultimate personal trainer. We serve millions of athletes monthly, and we have hundreds of workouts in our library. And you get training from elite athletes like Serena Williams, Simone Biles, and Ashton Eaton. One of the pillar features of our recent release is our adaptive coaching engine, which essentially, based on historical effort of workouts that you've done in the past, it prescribes you a future set of workouts to help achieve your maximum potential. Let's not forget about the Nike Plus Run Club, or NRC, and our recent release uh, with our partnership with Apple of the Apple Watch Nike Plus. Collectively, these two things are your perfect running partner. We serve millions of runners weekly in over 250 countries, and you get motivation from elite athletes who are chanting at you in your ear as you're running, and also from your friends who will cheer you on in the feed or you can compete against uh, with our leaderboard functionality. And this is one I use every week. Actually, I just ran earlier to get out some of the presentation jitters Hopefully, that shows. But to give you a little better understanding of the scale at which we deal with, I want to give you some high-level statistics about the system. First of all, oops. Sorry. First of all, we've been in the game for 10 years. Uh, the first Nike Plus product that launched uh, was the Shoe Puck, also a partnership with Apple. You put it in your shoe, you'd run. It was like a pedometer. And that's a lot of information. Over those 10 years, we've accumulated 1.2 billion plus activities. To make sure you understand what an activity is, think about it going on a run, or doing a training session, or playing basketball. If you're measuring that activity, you're collecting time series metrics like speed, or GPS coordinates, or heart rate. All of that gets bundled up and packaged with additional metadata and delivered to our service, and that's an activity. Again, microservice infrastructure, 100 services in our ecosystem. And we're a continuous delivery shop. We deploy fast, we deploy frequently, and on average, we deploy about six times a day. So with that scale comes some challenges. I want to share some of those challenges with you because you might be able to relate to some of them. First of all, like I said, been in the game 10 years. And we've had customers who've been with us that long. And so that means they have an expectation that we will keep that data for them. And so we have increasing data retention uh, challenges that we have to deal with, and Amazon helps us with that. Also, if you think about a run, it could be as short as you know, one second if you're you know, 
doing something quick, or as long as hours and hours. And if you think about the second dimension of the types of metrics that get delivered to us, like I mentioned earlier, we essentially have to deal with unbounded payload sizes. And that, that's, that can be a challenge to process that quickly in the time that our customers want. Our customers also have expectations of high availability. They, Nike is a luxury brand. They expect the best. And so we cannot be down at all. And so that's a big challenge we have to deal with, and Amazon helps us with that. And one of the things that we have to deal with on top of that is with high availability, that's extra redundancy. But we also want to make sure we're balancing the budget. So managing cost and scale together is one of the most important things we have to do. So Owen's explained to you some of the challenges that we've encountered. And addressing these has really required us to take a very principled approach to how we build things. So we're going to walk through a couple of the principles that have guided this. The first of these is acknowledging that it's a microservices world, at least for us at Nike. For us, this has been a big, main, big enabler. We're a large organization. We have a lot of moving parts, a lot of different groups that need to be able to move very quickly and to be able to push towards their own performance goals independently. Microservices introduce a lot of new patterns and practices and add some complexity, but we found that with automation, we can help simplify that a good bit. We've also started talking about this reactive term, and this may be new to some people here. Um, I'm going to walk through what reactive is about. There's really four key ideas that we want you to walk away from here understanding. This is what's driven the architecture we've built. So the first of these is about being responsive. This is about providing good user experience. So Nike is all about high quality experience. We want to make sure that all of our users have the best possible interaction with our apps that they can possibly have. If our systems have high latency and are not responding quickly, then that provides a poor experience. We can't have that happen. In addition to that, we have to be resilient. Failures are going to happen, particularly in the cloud with massive distributed systems and a lot of different moving parts. Things are going to fail. We have to assume that they're going to fail and build our systems in a way that acknowledges that and isolates it to make sure that the users never see that. We also have to be elastic. So being elastic is about being able to handle changing load over time. Nike, in particular, has, we have a partnership with Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart's a very popular celebrity out there, and he loves the Nike products. When he goes out for a run, he may tweet about that, he may post on Facebook. When that happens, thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of other people go out for runs during that same time period. We have to be able to scale up to handle that kind of load very quickly. We also have to be able to scale back down because after that, we don't want to keep running all those instances and add up all that cost over time unnecessarily. So being elastic is all about scaling up and down. And the foundation of all this is having a message-driven architecture. The, the network is fundamentally message-based and asynchronous. So acknowledging that at the core and building that into your foundation and building the abstractions on top of that enable all these other components of the reactive principles. So they're all very closely interdependent. Now, the last principle I want to talk about is being operations first. We're a DevOps shop, and for us, that means that every engineer is accountable to what they're building and what they're releasing to our customers. Operations is built in from the get-go, from day one, in order to minimize operational effort. So for us, this is a big piece of this is about metrics, logging, and tracing. Metrics are all about telling you how your system is behaving over time. Logging lets you see what your system is doing, and tracing lets you see how your systems are interacting with each other. And with microservices, this is incredibly important. So, this, we talk about evolution, and we wanted to give you a quick look at where we've come from, just so you can understand and potentially relate to it. Like we mentioned early on, uh, our original system was monolithic. And the series of bullets that you see, you might, you know, it might resonate with you. When you think about monoliths, you think about lots of engineers working in the same sandbox and depending on the same stuff, creating lots of risk. You know, I check in something, then Thomas checks in something, merge conflicts, all that jazz. And that, again, creates lots of risk. 
And one of the common ways to re reduce that risk is creating lots of environments to test in and have a release train, propagate it through. And, and that increases the maintenance cost to keep up those environments, but it doesn't always proportionally reduce risk. That was what we found. And because of those long release trains, I don't know if you've seen continuous delivery graphs, but the risk gets, grows up if you're not continuous delivery, and then you launch. And, and continuous delivery allows us to release or amortize that risk, excuse me, over time, uh, where a slow release train does not. So we've adopted this blueprint as we moved into the cloud. This is sort of a high-level architectural view. It's probably not going to be all that unfamiliar to a number of you. But really, it, it's all about building this microservice-based approach. So we have common infrastructure level services. This allows us to be that DevOps shop I was talking about. If, if every team's not having to rebuild logging and monitoring infrastructure, then you can have your teams operate their systems independently. Nike is very focused on building this kind of distributed system or distributed architecture, and this blueprint has really been the key enabler, allowing for that continuous delivery model that we've, we've adopted. So we're going to take you through the journey of data through our system and, and talk about in the context of the journey of a run. So this all starts within what we refer to as the fitness domain. This is about measure, coach, and motivate. These are the key pillars of the Nike Plus experience. These three things, measure, coach, and motivate, are what help our Nike Plus members run farther, train harder, and accomplish the goals they've set for themselves. So this is another view of this fitness domain. This kind of shows the systems that make it up, make up the fitness domain. There's a couple pieces here that we'll get to later. Up in the top right corner, you'll see the business intelligence system. That's where we dump all the data that we collect over time so that we can look at it at a high level view. Then we have this adaptive coaching, <coughs> excuse me, adaptive coaching engine down in the bottom left. But the key things here are to look at sync, activity, delta, and aggregates. And you'll notice a pattern here. There's this SNS and SQS interaction between each system. So this is that message-driven foundation that we're talking about. Now, when we started building these systems, SNS and SQS were the right choice for us. They allowed us to move very quickly and gave us the ability to be responsive because each of these systems could be asynchronous and not have to depend on responses from the other system allowed us to be elastic, so each of these pieces could scale independently, and it allowed us to have that resiliency because we could have failures in one area and not have it impact the rest of the system. Sorry about that. So we're going to talk about a Nike Plus Run Club member, Monique. Monique's a new runner. She's just starting out on her journey with Nike Plus Run Club. She's excited about getting healthier and challenging herself with Nike. She's planning to stay motivated through Just Do It Sundays, a campaign that we recently released as part of the Nike Plus Run Club app. And she's getting ready to go out for a run. It opens up the Nike Plus Run Club app, hits the start button. First thing it does is it uploads this very small payload to our system. This payload is really just an identifier that we use so that other things can happen within the system before we start collecting all those metrics for a run. When that payload comes in, we do a couple additional things behind the scenes. One, we return a change token. This is the, the payload is treated as an immutable event. So we need to identify those events so that the app can actually tell which events we've received. I mean, an app may lose its connection. It needs to know that it actually was able to successfully upload that payload. In addition, we generate a trace ID. This is something we're going to walk through throughout this journey and talk about is tracing and how tracing enables us to follow this journey throughout the whole data flow. This system is very simple when that payload comes in. That's a key thing to recognize. We want this to be very responsive. So all we're trying to do is get that data, collect it, and store it, and make sure that we've received it. So at the edge of the system, it's all about keeping it very scalable, very resilient, very responsive. Now, we store in both Cassandra and S3, and that's very important because, as Owen mentioned earlier, we have 10 years of data that we've collected over time. That's a lot of data. We have to be able to store all of that, but we also have to be able to interact with it quickly. So we use Cassandra as an indexing system and store you know, more recent data there so that we can handle that very effectively. 
At the end of the run, Monique presses the, the stop button on there. And the app sends in this updated version of the payload. Now, this is a new event in our system. This is treated as a layer on top of that previous event. At this point, we generate a new change token and re return that back to the app. Now, the, the payload includes a lot of additional data now. We've, we've kind of obscured it, but that metrics piece at the end, that's the important part. That's, that's actually where a whole lot of extra data is. So all of, the, all of her pace, all the GPS metrics, all of the uh, heart rate data, if she's wearing the Apple Watch Nike Plus, those all come in as part of that payload. Things start to get a little more interesting here. So again, that data comes into the sync service. We collect it. We store it to Cassandra and S3. We also generate a notification which goes out through SNS to SQS. That gets received by the activity service. The activity service, again, also leverages Cassandra and S3. This is a common pattern that we've adopted. And works very effectively for us and allows us to scale very readily. And it takes that and layers those events. And we'll talk about this a little more, but we may get multiple event, multiple of these activity payloads over time. So we generate materialized views in the activity service. Now, there's a little trickiness to this because of the fact that we chose SNS and SQS early on. That's not an ordered system. So we may get those payloads out of order. In addition, we may have multiple instances of the activity service pick those payloads up at the same time. And if we're trying to generate materialized views for a single user, it's challenging because you don't know what you're going to get out because those events may get ordered differently. So we actually chose to use ElastiCache Redis here. You can see it way over on the far side there to implement a distributed lock. So we make sure that a single instance of the activity service is only ever responsible for one user at a time. This was a consolation because of how we had used SNS and SQS early on, but it allowed us to quickly keep moving without having to adopt a whole new messaging pattern in there. So after Monique's finished her run, she has a few additional things that she can do. She can add data to that activity to tell us a little bit about the conditions of the run. She can tell us where the run took place. So, and this is like, you can see it says road on the screenshot there. Some people do indoor runs, and they keep track of that in the app. She can also add details about what shoes she ran in. So for dedicated runners, they want to track the mileage on their shoes and make sure that they retire those over time and, and keep track of that. In addition, the app sends in some other metadata, like weather, temperature. That stuff all goes into the system again as yet another immutable event, gets a new change token. Each of these allows the app to identify that that data was received and know which things we've actually processed. After she's finished her run, one of the things Monique wanted, wants to know is how she's done over the lifetime of her experience with the Nike Plus Run Club. So she wants to see her lifetime mileage or see how her pace is in, has improved over time. This is where things get a little challenging because now we're starting to talk about larger chunks of data. For some people who have been on the platform for that entire 10 years, you can imagine that lifetime of data gets rather large. If we were going to generate these aggregates on the fly every time, that would not be feasible to give that user a quick response. The way we approach this is we introduce this idea of the delta system. So this is actually taking a snapshot of our views of that data. Each time an activity comes in and a notification comes through that an activity has been updated, the Delta service takes that activity and breaks it up into our slices and then compares each of those slices against previous views of that activity data. So it's using those materialized views in the activity system and comparing them to generate deltas. Those deltas are commutative, so we can take those and whatever order they come into the aggregate system, we didn't want the aggregate system to necessarily have to worry as much about ordering. We can make sure that those aggregates always get generated correctly. So <clears throat> Monique ran. She finished her run. She's tired but excited. And she's progressing. Her and a, a group of her friends wanted to get healthy together, so she wants to share her accomplishments with them. So at the end of the run, she hits the share button. And for some reason, she ran with my dog, Rolf. And so she takes a photo of him and annotates it with a hashtag, just do it, uh, because it's just do it Sunday. Let's explore 
how that data flows through the system. So that goes into the social domain. And the social domain is all about sharing your accomplishments, cheering each other on, and engaging each, excuse me, each other through comments. So when Monique posts the data to our system, there's actually an incident going on. What's going to happen? Some of the hosts in our system are having problems indicated in red. Each of those big gray boxes is one of our availability zones in US West 2, which is the region that we're primarily housed in. Now, let's talk about the data flow here. Monique is the phone. It runs through our content delivery network edge. And then via Route 53 random DNS routing, it gets pointed to one of our edge routers. Now, the edge router is aware of all of the domains that we've got, as well as all of the services tied to those domains via service discovery. We use uh, Eureka, which is an open source Netflix product, as our service discovery server. So it's aware of that. And because responsiveness is important to us, it attempts to post to the host in the closest availability zone to the edge, because that is faster. But there's a problem with that, as you can see. One thing to note here is that on the way in, just like Thomas mentioned earlier, a trace ID gets assigned to the request at the edge. And when the request is recognized as having a problem, the, those, both of those messages get logged with that trace ID, both the successful request acceptance at the edge as well as the challenge with the post domain. Now, so what happens because there's a challenge here? Well, because we have service discovery and because we have uh, retries built into our HTTP request uh, library, we have resilience in the system. The edge router is aware of the other hosts in the region, and it reroutes the request very quickly to a post domain host that is up. And that writes to Cassandra. Everything's happy. Uh, one thing to note here is also the hashtags domain, which is a service, uh, had an issue. We, we write some data to Elastic, or, excuse me, Elasticsearch uh, for fast lookup of hashtags, and we have a proxy there to do some authorization between the host and Elasticsearch, and that history, so system had an issue. Now, this is here to illustrate the fact that not only does our edge have resilience, but all of our service layers have res this same resilience. So it recognizes that there's a problem, logs that with the trace ID, writes it to the other Elasticsearch proxy, which is up and functioning, and Monique has a great experience uh, because we're resilient. So because we're resilient and through the, the issues that we're going on, uh, we still write the post. Mark, one of her friends who is joining her in this journey about getting healthy, uh, gets a notification on his phone. And he wants to encourage her because they're, they're building up a, a group of positivity, trying to encourage each other. And so, he clicks on the notification, opens up the post, and writes a comment to her. Now, we still have this issue going on in our system, but through the beauty of, of the resilience, we've already talked about how that's good at the service level, right? But let's just talk quickly about the data flow for Mark, because this illustrates another point. So the data flow gets randomly routed to US West 2C. The edge router routes it to the comments domain, which is up. Now, the database, though, the node in that availability zone is having issues. So what happens there? Well, Dynamo-style databases, like Cassandra, also have resilience built in. And that's actually very critical. You can't just have resilience at your service layer. Because if your data store isn't highly available, you're, you're not really going to give your customers a good experience. And so you should make sure that as you select that, you pick something like Dynamo or Cassandra, because the driver that interfaces with it is aware of the whole cluster. And it immediately reroutes and delivers to a known good node. And the beauty of the Cassandra host is that once the node that's having challenges gets replaced or comes back online, it will reconcile all that through the beauty <coughs> of eventual consistency. Excuse me. Now, we talked about trace IDs uh, and logging here. And all of that gets fed to our central log management system. So all of our uh, DevOps engineers can evaluate and examine impacted customers to ensure that they all had a good experience. That's very critical here. So as we mentioned, when Monique shared her under the feed, 
she, well, one of the things we didn't mention is that she's a public user, so she's agreed to share her data publicly. When she shared her data to the feed, she included that just do it hashtag. That meant that her data fed into our leaderboard system, so she was able to compete against other, other members who use that hashtag. Now, there's also this friends leaderboards, which is a fairly straightforward case. If you are a member of our platform and you have added friends on the, using the social tools in there, then you'll get ranked against your friends. That's fairly straightforward. We're used to that from a lot of other apps. But the hashtag leaderboards is a little more interesting case because we may have situations where we have tens of thousands of users and we have to, we have to rank them very quickly. So one of these runs where they're using the just do it hashtag, if, if they're all running within a short period of time, again, we have, we have to do that ranking very quickly and be very responsive. Typically, with our leaderboards, we store those in Cassandra. So that gives us our durable data store. It's where all the long-term data goes. But doing that ranking operation directly in Cassandra is a, a little expensive. It's not fast. We leverage ElastCache Redis here, which gives us a log-n operation there because we use the sorted set, and it makes it very quick. So we still use, C, uh, excuse me, we still use Cassandra here because it gives us that durability, and we can do fast reloads of leaderboard data into the Redis system when we need to. So one of the last things Monique and her friends are doing to ensure that they're being the best self is leveraging our adaptive coaching engine. And the Just Do It Sundays are a stage on her journey to be her best self. And so she wants to check off the fact that she did it today and check into her coaching plan. And we'll take a little bit of time to describe the architecture there. So fundamentally, our adaptive training engine is at the core of both our Nike Plus training club coach and our Nike Plus run club coach. And like I mentioned early on, it evaluates historical effort, so acti activities you've done in the past. And based on that effort and your goal, prescribes future effort to achieve your maximum potential. Now, each of the coaches interprets that abstract effort value differently. The running coach prescribes different types of runs, whether it's a speed run or a recovery run. And the training coach leverages the workout library to prescribe various workouts. Now, we're going to step away from Monique's story a little bit here and talk about the training club and the workout library. Now, the workout library, each of the workouts, has a master trainer associated effort. Nike has master trainers on staff, and they deal with lots of athletes, both elite athletes and folks like you and me. And through that experience, they've given a, a really good general assessment of what a workout of a thing like a burpee or push-ups or suicides might be. But because, like Thomas mentioned, Nike Digital's mission is to serve every athlete personally, we wanted to do better and we believe we could. So Thomas talked a little bit about how we send a lot of data into our BI system. And our business intelligence system is fundamentally backed by S3. Now, if you think about batch-based machine learning, there's typically three phases. There is the data prep phase, there's the model execution phase, and then there's the service of prediction uh, phase. And, and we use Apache Airflow to orchestrate these jobs. Now, to be clear, the data prep phase is all about taking your giant data lake of information and reducing it down to the information that's actually relevant and valuable for your model. And so Apache Airflow spins up uh, a Spark 2.0 EMR5 cluster uh, to start doing that work. And it processes and processes and takes the, all the values and reduces it down to the, the fields that matter to predict effort. And it writes that out into another S3 bucket. Apache Airflow gets uh, made aware of that, that is finished, and then it triggers another Spark job to, to execute. And that's running the machine learning model. And the machine learning model we're using here is, is collaborative filtering. For those of you who don't really understand what collaborative filtering is, think about it this way. Like you, sir, maybe you and I do 30 workouts, and you do you know, 10 
different than I, but the 20 we've done, we rate them similarly from an effort perspective. Now, it's reasonable to assume that if I want to do a workout that you've done that I have not, that I would probably rate it like you. And if you think about that at the scale of the millions of customers we deal with, that ends up being the statistical model that then outputs personalized uh, recommendation, uh, or excuse me, personalized predictions of, of effort for each of the workouts. And so that job then writes all that information. You think about a data set of all of our customers on one side and all of our workouts on another side. And then the effort prediction service then reads that in and then serves it up to the training coach. So when a customer requests for the next workout that they should do at effort X, that will serve something personal. Now, if you haven't done enough workouts to really make that valuable, we will fall back onto the master trainer uh, assessed effort, which is really pretty good already. But it's, it's, uh, it's better to be personal in this case. So we talked a little bit about Monique's journey. You know, we talked about the responsiveness uh, of the system and how we've applied principles to deal with that. We've talked about how we deal with making sure our system is resilient to the unknowns that come at us and how we can make sure that Monique gets a great customer experience. Now, our journey to deliver that great experience has everything you'd expect from a journey. And here are some lessons that we've learned on our own and from others that you might benefit from. First of all, if I haven't harped on this enough, reactive first. Be, the reactive principles are very, very important in this, in this day and age. And in a microservice ecosystem, you're typically I.O. bound. If you think about the data flow, you saw you know, in Monique's post, uh, you know, ran through four or five different systems. And one system was just waiting on the next system to complete the request, uh, except for in the message-driven architecture where you have the queue in between. And reactive architectures get you close, right? If you have that message-driven architecture in between, that's great. But to really get there all the way, you should have a non-blocking IL service container that your services run on because of that delay. And, and the reason for that is because you want to maximize utilization. And this cost, high availability, balance that we all have to do, utilization is the key metric that you need to pay attention to to ensure that you're being maximally efficient from a cost perspective. Um, one of the things we've, we actually just released in our open source site, which we'll share with you shortly, is a product called Repost, which is an open source non-blocking IO service container built on top of Medi. And so that might be able to help you if some of you are interested. So we've mentioned tracing throughout this. And as you can imagine, with all these different systems, and there, there's far more systems involved than even what we talked about, following that data through all that system is challenging. So building tracing at the core has been really an important thing for us to be able to continue that journey and actually succeed and know that our data is, is getting through the system correctly. Now, you have to recognize that not every system is going to support this. So sometimes you'll be dealing with a legacy system or a third-party system, and they may not support your tracing. So coming up with approaches that address that is really important. We've, we've found a few. Um, it also, as it, anybody who watched Werner's keynote this morning saw that Amazon just announced X-Ray, we're actually already looking at integrating that in with our tracing functionality. So there are things that are evolving there, and there's a lot to keep an eye on. So order matters you know, in, in, a, in a lot of cases. If you're doing a distributed environment, you have to make sure you can support out of order data, whether that's picking a messaging architecture that can help you deal with out of order data uh, or using systems that can help augment that like we did with distributed locks with Redis. Ar if, if you pick an architecture or in the process of picking an architecture now, I would encourage you to, to Think about a tool like Kinesis. One of the things, the reasons we didn't choose Kinesis early on was because it wasn't available in our region. And by the time it was available and it was feature rich enough to handle our use case, we'd already gone all in on this SNS and SQS thing. But if you're in the, 
in the early stages of des designing your architecture, I highly encourage you to do that. There's also Kafka. And one of the things that reasons why we didn't choose Kafka at the time was because we didn't want to take on the operational overhead of managing a Kafka and Zookeeper cluster and all that stuff. But if you guys have the experience to do that, then, then it's, a, it's an awesome choice. Another thing that Thomas mentioned earlier is when you don't want to have a message system that forces ordering or you don't need it, you might be able to get away with choosing a data structure that's order agnostic, like in the aggregates case, where we build commutative uh, immutable units. You know, so if, if you have systems that can build on top of that, I'd highly encourage you to look up uh, conflict-free, excuse me, conflict-free replicated data types, because that could give you a good basis to help not have to force ordering in your messaging system. So Owen already alluded to this a little bit, and we've talked about it throughout the conversation, throughout the presentation in various ways, but we've made a lot of different choices along the way that have really been focused around reducing operational overhead. So the, the, the case of choos choosing SNS and SQS versus Kafka, which we did look at at the time, was really about this, this choice around operational overhead. Kafka would have involved a lot of init additional initial setup, whereas we were able to quickly get moving with SNS and SQS. We had to do other things down the road because we made that choice, but those were quick things that we were able to accomplish without a lot of additional effort. So I think we succeeded very well there. Now, in another case, we've used Cassandra very heavily throughout the system. Dynamo might have been a, DynamoDB might have been a great choice there, but we already had Cassandra expertise in-house. We had built out a lot of muscle around that and understood how to operate it effectively. So this really comes down to a lot of choices around manage versus non-manage, buy versus build, and understanding how your system is going to evolve over time. Looking at that and looking at where you have the expertise and where you want to develop that, that internal ability to handle these systems is important to understand how to move forward on this. The last thing is in an on-demand infrastructure architecture like AWS provides, managing costs needs to be core to your technical design up front. And we talked about utilization, ensuring that you're instrumenting all of the things that impact utilization for you. In most cases, if you're using a non-blocking I.O. framework, your utilization is primarily in the CPU. But there are certain cases where you're going to be memory bound or disk bound. And so you, you want to make sure that you're instrumenting all of that and delivering that because Amazon's utilization metric is really only about CPU out of the box. And if, if you haven't heard about them already, I'm sure you have, but make sure you can leverage things like Trusted Advisor. The folks talk about spot instances for, for short-term workloads and various other things because that's, it's really important to be cost sensitive in your infrastructure. And we do this by designing with that upfront. So we want to make sure that you walk away understanding some of the lessons that we've learned um, as, as we walked through the, the data flow of this app and, and talked about the journey of our evolution over time. This really comes down to a few key things. So focusing on those reactive principles and understanding what that means, understanding how to be resilient, elastic, responsive, knowing how to leverage that message-driven infrastructure to build all of that effectively. Acknowledging that microservices are an enabler, but that they also do add some complexity, so you have to have that operational capability in there, too. So building in things like tracing, logging, having a good monitoring system in there, and then being able to understand your data. So we, we've talked a lot about how we've looked at the data and, and how, we've, how we use that to provide functionality. In our case, EMR has been a huge, huge help there. Those kinds of tools are worth looking at and definitely have been a, an important part of this journey. And that the Athena announcement is going to be pretty, pretty dope, too, for, oh, yeah. for that. All right, all right, last, <laughs> last thing. Uh, plug, engineering.nike.com. That will send you to our GitHub site, for our, which houses our open source information. Repost is that non-blocking IO service container, and some of the libraries above it help ensure that you have resilience built in. Wingtips is a Java-based tracing library built, designed around the Dapper paper. Uh, Willow and Elevate are some Swift libraries, one for uh, logging on your iOS apps and the other for JSON parsing in the Swift style, the functional style. And if you didn't catch the talk on Tuesday,
by our compatriots Andrew and Nick Cerberus, our key management system built on top of HashiCorp Vault and Amazon KMS is all open source up there too. So please check us out, star it, fork it, you know, uh, and give us some feedback. And thanks again for taking the time to spend learning from us. And we want to, excited to learn from you too. <laughs>